The grand leading principle towards which every argument unfolded in these pages directly converses is the absolute and essential importance of human development in its richest diversity. This quote, taken from Wilhelm von Humboldt's Sphere and Duties of Government, forms the epigraph to John Stuart Mill's On Liberty and encapsulates the liberal attitude to politics with near-perfect clarity, laying bare and legible all of its not inconsiderable appeal, as well as its intrinsic vulnerabilities, of which we will here be particularly concerned with two. The appeal of this view of politics is obvious. The end of the state and its institutions is turned away from things beyond the human, whether God or truth or reality, and directed toward the flourishing of the individual human subject. Human beings are freed from responsibility to the non-human and made solely responsible to each other, or this is how it becomes understood in its most sophisticated formulation, that of especially American pragmatist philosophers like Peirce, James, Dewey, and Rorty. Under this system, the only norms which must be respected are those upon which the individual freedom of other subjects is conditioned. Liberal subjects are free to exercise their individual powers in concert or in isolation, provided in so doing they do not harm one another or hinder one another's freedom, permitting human creativity and curiosity to unprecedentedly increase our powers and to maximize both our collective and our individual happiness. And it seems to deliver. Without going into detail, the advent of liberal assumptions about the relationship between political legitimacy and the consent of the governed has attended not just an unprecedented expansion of political equality, but also the emergence of a critical turn in social thinking that challenges the naturalness of traditional seats of power. The key weaknesses of this view of politics are twofold. First, this is an entirely inward-facing view of politics that simply assumes the sovereignty of the liberal state as a nodal web between independent subjects and cannot manage mass insurrectionary movements without breaking from its own ethos. The function of institutions is to protect freedom, but if these institutions are themselves under attack, the liberal attitude supplies no formula for how they can defend themselves without restricting human freedom on the grounds of a principle held above and over the deliberations of the community. Since freedom is a condition of human flourishing on this view, and these institutions are understood to be what facilitates human freedom, the liberal state can only seem to protect itself in a crisis by destroying its own identity as liberal. Second, the liberal state must presume a notion of human flourishing that is itself both culturally contingent and restrictive of certain other conceptions of flourishing in order to justify the imposition of its order on any given population in any given space. Yes, it appears, when well executed again, to deliver exactly what it advertises, individual freedom to avail oneself of all of society's goods with complete autonomy restricted only by what is contrary to the individual freedom of other subjects. The rub lies in that it insists that its notion of freedom and flourishing simply has privileged rights with respect to the rights of communities bound by land, history, culture, blood, religion, philosophy, or whatever you like. When these assert themselves against individual liberty, this is simply assumed, must simply be assumed, to be a tyranny in order to reassert the legitimacy of the liberal state over and above them. A contemporary illustration of this may be found in Francis Widdowson and Albert Howard's 2008 book, Disrobing the Aboriginal Industry, which does not come with my recommendation, by the way, in which you will find a chapter entitled Self-Government, an inherent right to tribal dictatorships, in which Widdowson and Howard characterize attempts to maintain ethnic and cultural distinctiveness by some indigenous groups in Canada as philosophically akin to what happened in Nazi Germany and apartheid South Africa. Note here that freedom to engage with the broader colonial state as a liberal subject is simply assumed to undercut the autonomy of the community under consideration to govern its own affairs as it sees fit, even though that community is itself making a bid for sovereignty as a peer to the liberal state, not as a subject. We don't have to endorse any action taken by such a community to observe that in this case, the legitimacy of its own vantage point has been simply removed from the picture. Its community members are only its own, so long as the liberal state approves of how it governs, which is to say, in fact, that it cannot really govern at all, except by the liberal state's permission which makes the liberal state sovereign over it, which means it is not sovereign, cannot be sovereign by definition. Because the liberal attitude sets a specific understanding of human freedom and flourishing as the purpose of its institutions, 
which includes the purpose of the state itself, an understanding of human freedom that itself must assume a certain understanding of human nature that is not uncontested, it treats politics as if it were something to be overcome and set aside, as something that has been overcome and set aside, so that the real business of quote-unquote politics of the state can be attended to, facilitating the consummation of this specific understanding of human flourishing. What we see here is that the liberal state's attitude, indeed the only tool in its kit, for dealing with the plurality of communities that may exist within its territory, their competing ideals and conceptions of human nature, of historical, cultural, religious, or ethnic identity, and the different ideas of what obligations these have on specific human beings, is the brute assumption of their total subjugation. Which means that when these are not in fact subjugated, when these gain enough influence and power to actually challenge the liberal state and begin to do so, liberals are left with no recourse but to either vainly condemn the violation of principles which have nothing but the very authority being challenged to commend them, or to abandon those principles themselves and engage in the activity with which politics is actually concerned, that being war, and put down the enemies of the state by force. Liberalism understood as a political theory which assumes that the role of institutions is defending and facilitating human freedom and flourishing is a self-terminating mistake, which is why no state actually abides by it. In practice, liberal states must put down historical and moral challenges to its authority with force, with violence, and it is only due to the overwhelming power of the state itself that this violence is itself often conceived of as something ultimately fixed and benign itself a mere institution, mere policing, because it assumes in the liberal imaginary the same privileged background place as reality, or God, as that which simply is and must be. And the shock experienced in those rare occasions when powers other than the state assert themselves is similar to the experience of losing one's faith. Properly understood, liberalism is not an approach to politics, but is rather a cultural and administrative ideal an ideal that may be aspired to only within the context of a bounded state already established by illiberal violence. It must be so regarded, because liberalism is incapable, by its own lights, of justifying the illiberal and violent actions that states must take to establish and maintain a liberal ethic within a territory, or of efficaciously defending itself without the deployment of those actions. Moreover, by misapplying the liberal ideal as a justification of state sovereignty rather than a cultural ideal that may be pursued once state sovereignty is established, the subjugating and often genocidal actions that were taken to effect that establishment, what would by its own lights be registered as gross ethical wrongs, are buried beneath a fairy story that it's really there so it can secure the greatest good for the greatest number, and not in fact to secure the greatest goods as booty for itself. As always, thank you for listening, and take care.